Hi, Rob. Welcome to Savvy Broadcasting Life Unscripted. We're so grateful to have you here today. How are you? I'm just really excited to be here. I mean, it, not only savvy, it's high energy, I can tell. Oh, that's that's my brand, baby. Uh, we, have, like <laughs> we have Rob Mark today, senior editor of Flying Magazine. He's not just a pilot, an aviation writer, editor, video and audio producer. He has also worked at uh, air traffic control for 10 years, as well as being an Air Force, working in the U.S. Air Force. So you have a vast experience, Rob. So we're so grateful to have you here today. Well, thank you. I, I like to think of it as a vast amount of experience. My friends always told me, though, that I just couldn't hold a job. <laughs> but you've had some really impressive jobs that some people could only hope to have. But we're going to talk about something that's very important, both in the cockpit, both in business and in life, and that is effective communications as well as decisive decision making, which if you don't do very well in the cockpit, it might be your last day. Uh, well, not so much. Very true. You're absolutely right there. And, and the effective communication, I mean, we talked about this a little bit last week and, and I said it, it's only it's only effective if if you say something to me and I, I say, oh, I understand or gee, I'm not sure. And then you do something to clarify it. And I go, ah, I'm a little slow, but I got it now. Uh, because without that, you didn't really uh, all you did really was talk to somebody. Exactly. Not quite the same. Yeah. And you talked and thank you. You, you talked at them. Mm -hmm. And for a lot of people, it, we see this in, gosh, I see this happen a lot lately, that people really love to talk about their lives, yeah. which is which is great. I mean, we all have exciting lives. Some people have lives that are more exciting than others. But occasionally, you, you need to take a breath and say, well, tell me about you and where you grew up or what, how you got involved and how you became so savvy, uh, you know, or something, because yeah. that really opens, to me at least, a lot of insights into the other person that you're, you're trying to communicate with. Um, what I have found over decades is that pilots really are not very good at that. Hmm. Uh, very good at playing with the toys in the, in the cockpit, the electronics. They're good at flying the airplane. But as far as communication, mm, it's not their strongest suit. Yeah, and what, why do you think that is? Because one thing that drives me nuts, and we talked about before the interview, is when you're on air traffic control, you're speaking to air traffic control or to other pilots, oft, what's necessary is that you say your tail number, which is the numbers that are on the back of your tail on your airplane. And that's a way for air, ATC and other people to identify your aircraft. And uh, people will be like, and they'll, they'll garble their numbers. I'm like, dude, just speak up. Or they'll you know ramble on and on or just not, you know, do communication when they need to do communication. Like if you're a, a non-towered airport and you need to tell people, hey, I'm here, don't hit me. Uh, and they just like, will call up uh, to people on the ground saying, anyone down there, let me know if you're here. It's like, no, dude, you need to tell people where you are. <laughs> that's that's right. And, and I think you mentioned an important part for people that don't fly. Uh, those registration numbers mm -hmm. on the back of our airplane is, is how we identify ourselves. Or if it's an airline flight, it might be American 248, United 607, uh, mm -hmm. uh, you know, Delta 1427. But when air traffic control says something to a pilot, you know, turn left, turn right, climb, descend, whatever, they have to know that the pilot got it and that they understood it. And mm -hmm. so the pilot will respond with, Roger, you know, Delta 1427 will descend to 8,000. Mm -hmm. Because then the controller goes, this, this person's on it. Mm -hmm. But w what I see happen a lot, I used to see this in the cockpit, uh, even and certainly outside of the airplane, is that I, I'd say something, yeah. and I'd go, you know, when I was being nice, I'd say, I'm sorry, did you hear what I said? Communication is a two-way street, boys and girls. It, it is. I mean, it, it, it's this? very simple in the office. I've got to go yeah. uh, uh, copy a document to blow. Oh, well, I've got to go in there, too. Do you want to go first? Do you want me to do it? Mm -hmm. 
okay. Be and, decisive. Uh, There's that decisive thing you were talking yes. about. Yes. Yes. Uh, and you had mentioned even in your timelines, well, working as senior editor of Flying Magazine, you you will you email someone, give them a timeline, we need this story. And you had said, no, there's some time that I give a deadline and people just don't get back to me. I don't know what's going on. I don't know if you're working on the project or not working on the project. You need to get back to me. So this is where it comes in in business. We have all these forms of communication from cell phones to email, you name it. But I find that often, even in business, people are not communicating as effectively as they could. Well, that's true. And I, I used to, I, when I, I taught at Northwestern in the journalism school for a bunch of years. And I would see, the, I only taught graduate students, but I would see this with them. You know, and I would ask questions and <laughs> just kind of sit there. I mean, I know that when you're in class, the last thing somebody wants to do is be the first one to raise their hand. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, we uh, we tried the Socratic method, which was, so, Christina, what, what do you think about the, uh, the state of the world today? Mm -hmm. And now I put you on the spot, and you've got to say something. You've either got to say, I don't have a clue, and I don't care, mm. or, well, I think this, that, or whatever. But at least I'm going to get some, some response out of you. Yeah. Um, you know what I think it might be, Rob? I think it might be a combination of having too many options to communicate. Uh, people used to say to me when I first started my business, hey, I emailed you and or I texted you and you didn't get back to me in five minutes. Well, I said, well, I do emails twice a day. That's it. And so you got to fit in one of those time slots, baby, because I have work to do and I want to focus on the levels of work I have to do. And at two times during the day, I do the email stuff. Um, but what it is i think is that because we have so many different ways to communicate people are just like they want instant gratification they want to be dealt with immediately but then i think what ends up happening is that you're never really focused on one thing and because you're not focused on one thing you don't remember to communicate you don't remember to get back to someone because you're you're so all over the place you're checking an email you're on facebook you're talking to a friend you're getting a cup of coffee i think it's kind of separated us or put us in so many places that we don't know how to stay here and now well, i think that's i think there's a certain amount of truth in that and then let's face it since social media came to be everybody wants their time in the sun they think that whatever they tweeted or picture they posted on instagram or something they said on facebook mm -hmm. they actually don't even well i've known people don't even read the responses they just want to see how many of them there are because <laughs> They had a lot, and it must have been really important. Um, but again, I, I think what, what you find in business, and I'm sure you've seen this, is that mm -hmm. what you want to tell people when they demand this, why didn't you get back to me right away? Uh, I'm sorry, mm -hmm. you're not that important. I have I have 11 other people to deal with here, and they all think they're important too. So I have to I have to kind of prioritize and and look at whatever the whatever the goal is in the cockpit it was how do we get from here to there mm -hmm. not go through the thunderstorms or uh you know when the weather gets bad how do we divert to some other place and keep yeah. the people in the back happy uh and tell them what's going on uh without me worrying about your ego mm -hmm. uh and uh, you know and i don't mean this just about ladies but men too are sometimes very easily offended these days mm. uh, and um you you need to find a way to te to talk to each other communicate but do it with respect absolutely I mean, because if the only way i can get you to listen to me is for me to yell at you mm. or point at you or do something then th there's some whole other issue going on and, and i don't know how what's your background in aviation but you know all these cool terms. <laughs> Actually, I was scared to death of flying. In 2006, I decided I would take flying lessons to kick my fear of flying. And I went to the, took 13 lessons, and then uh, I met my, my husband. And he is a full-fledged pilot, a commercial pilot, uh, studying to be a CFI right now. And so that's how I entered the world of flying. Um, you know, first to get rid of my fear and then meeting my, my uh, husband. Wow, that's pretty cool. Well, so then that means you can talk about all this stuff anytime you want. Or you, when you have questions, you have a pretty good resource. I do. That's I a do. great thing. And and how many times I would I would do that in a classroom, and I'd I'd look at and I'd say, 
you guys don't have a clue what I'm talking about, do you? And they go, <laughs> okay, wait, let me, let me try this again. Let's, let's look at it from a different perspective. Imagine, and I'll give them a different metaphor that perhaps explains it better, uh, because sometimes we do get caught up in, especially in, in aviation acronyms mm. and jargon, and, and nobody likes to say, I don't know what he's talking about. <laughs> I don't want to look <laughs> stupid. <laughs> Or the, or the best one, I watched somebody uh, co-teaching a class that said, so is there anybody in the room that didn't get that? Does that make sense to everybody? Well, who's going to be the one that says, oh, actually, sir, I, I didn't I I don't have a clue it. what you're saying, uh, you know, which we learn early on, even as flight instructors, is, is the worst way to try to bring you know, understanding to a situation. <laughs> Uh, and, and we're not talking about somebody saying, that was a stupid course, uh, the book was boring, whatever. We're mm -hmm. talking about putting people in airplanes, potentially by themselves, uh, mm -hmm. into situations where it could be extremely dangerous if they don't really understand the subject, but also why a, a teacher is suggesting they, they try this or try that. And the why, I think, is a really important part of it. Yeah, the why of it. And I think that's what you do during the teaching of flight is that you really get into why is this being done? My teacher would say, ask me, okay, you just did that. Why did you do that? I, because you did it. I'm imitating you. <laughs> right. That happens a lot. It happens a lot. And, you know, it's, it's our job before we sign somebody off, even for solo, to go through those situations and say, uh, okay, now we could go this way or we could go that way. You'll notice that it's very blue sky over here and kind of blue over here. and But up there, it's kind of dark, and we probably wouldn't want to go that way. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. okay. Tell me, why do you think I wouldn't want to go that way? I don't know. <laughs> okay, good answer. At least you're admitting you don't know, and, and we would carry on from there. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it, and it uh, again, when you work with people God, in an office or anything else, People, a lot of people just do what they're told. Uh, they say, look, yeah. she told me to do this, and that's what I'm doing. She's my boss. It's not my job to question it. I'm, I'm sorry. See, I grew up in the 60s where we questioned everything, where everybody over the age of 30 was suspect <laughs> until we got to be 30, and then, of course, we realized how intelligent we were. Uh, <laughs> But, uh, you know, and, and there are a lot of people that don't like that at all. They do not like being, uh, they call it challenged. Mm -hmm. um, I don't call it challenged when I say, I'm sorry, that I don't get it. I don't, mm -hmm. why are we doing this? Yeah. Uh, you know, and, and when it basically gets down to, because I told you to. Okay, mm. I can get that. It doesn't foster uh much creativity anywhere or uh, but you know there are people that really love to run businesses like that yeah well the, the question the, what you mentioned here Rob, about making the question if where you're working you hope is a business that is open to questions allows for the op options as you said for creativity but also to possibly see a better way to do things if we all come to the table like okay why are we doing this what could we do that makes it better perhaps yes mm -hmm. uh, not to mention the fact that there are times that even though you're the boss, you might be wrong. Mm. You know, I mean, you it might just not, you might have come up with something and or missed something and someone goes, oh, you know what, did you know that somebody else already did this and it didn't work? And you go, mm. sure, I knew that. I mean, uh, absolutely. I'm like, <laughs> and you know, <laughs> see, that's the worst part is when somebody tries to finagle the conversation to pretend like they knew something when they obviously didn't. Yeah, obviously. Uh, I, I suffered from, uh, you know, when I was a child, my mom used to tell me I was a terrible liar. And so every time I tried, I always got caught. And it was only uh, two years ago that I figured out how to get around that. Um, maybe it was three years ago. But, you know, you mentioned, too, the, the decision-making. Mm -hmm. That's hard because people feel like they do have so many choices. Mm -hmm. um, but I think if flying taught me anything, it's how to be a good risk manager, uh, how to look at a situation, even, mm -hmm. uh, you know, something simple. I mean, we just went through this where I live, where uh, uh, we were dealing with a, uh, a 
a company in the community that was doing something really unsafe. And I'm sorry, as a pilot, I am such a safety geek. I see things that nobody else notices. And, you know, I move things out of the way on the floor going, someone's going to break their neck on this if we don't move it out of the way. And my daughter would say, oh, my God, Dad, all right. You know, I mean, but even now, she'll, she's gotten to be very practical. Mm-hmm. And her friends tell her the same thing. You know, how do you notice all this stuff? I don't know. I'm just a curious guy, I guess. Yeah. I like that you mentioned that too, Rob, because you said that you've gotten really good at risk management and decision making being a pilot. Because in the cockpit, you have to make practical and right decisions that get you to the, you know, get you to not crash the airplane. But you have to be able to do that in a systematic way that keeps you safe. And you can carry that straight into life and into business that you can carry things out in a systematic way where um, you are making decisive decisions, but at the same time, practical decisions that are well thought out. Well, that's true. And, And I think you always have to ask yourself with whatever the situation is, what's the risk of me doing nothing? Of me just sitting here and watching the world go by? What's the risk of me making this decision? What if I do that? And if you can do that, and it doesn't have to be instantaneous, but but people get so hung up on, mm-hmm. what if I make the wrong decision? Well, then it was like the communication thing. We'll know what doesn't work. I mean, short of a life and death kind of situation. Uh, you know, I, I think I'm having a, a, a brain hemorrhage and actually you're having a you're, you're somebody's stepping on your foot, you know, I, you get it completely screwed up. I mean, but again, in general, um, the, the worst that's going to happen is that you say, that was really dumb. And I, you know, and, and I've done that a, a lot where I've said, man, I really thought that was going to work. And it just, oh, well, all right. So somebody else have a better idea. That's but it. then I, I think from what my daughter tells me, and she's, she, she could have been my shrink. She tells me things that are so honest, mm-hmm. out of love. And, and she said, you know, Dad, you, you have a, a knack of being able to, to admit when you're wrong. And not a lot of guys do that. Yeah, and, not a lot uh, of people do that. <laughs> I, well, you're right. And, and, you know, again, why can't well, Because their egos are so wrapped up into, I'm the, I, I have 37,000 followers on Twitter. And what are they going to think of me if I made a mistake? They don't even know you for the most part. (laughs) You mentioned something very important, uh, Rob, and now I'll uh, have to end out our time here, which is that you don't have to be beating yourself up. Realize a mistake. Be willing to look at your mistakes and say, hey, it didn't work out. Cross uh, cross correct and keep moving forward. Yeah, I I think it's seeing. And so to me, I think what that does too is it leaves you some time to get absolutely crazy about a few things when something really goes wrong that you have no control of and it drives you nuts uh, because if you do that you know like well, what should I get the grocery store you you will probably be goofy by the time you're 40 I don't know or something you'll end up in an insane asylum if you keep yeah. that up yeah so my life's a little easier now I think actually than it was 30 mm-hmm. years ago so but that's just yeah. me Well, I I think we have a lot of great tools and just using them responsibly um, can make communications easier if we realize that are we really using them effectively? Are we communicating effectively? Are we making decisions that are are decisive and keeping us on the path we want to get to, the ultimate goal? Um, But this has been a fascinating conversation, Rob. I I thank you so much for coming today. Now, you work at flyingmag.com. Where can people find out more about you and, and email you or talk to you if they want? Uh, well, I also um, I also write a blog called Jetwine.com, which is an industry blog. Uh, it's been around since 2006. Back in the early days, when we were still doing blogs on the backs of uh, soap boxes or something, I don't know. Uh, Jetwine on Instagram, uh, Jetwine on Twitter, uh, all kinds of places like that. And uh, I, I always like talking to new people and hearing what they have to say and. Uh, I, so I'm always happy if anybody uh, comes across this and they didn't think I sounded too uh, too goofy. I mean, give, give, you know, send us a, a note or something, you know. 
Absolutely, absolutely. And uh, everyone also go check out the wonderful work that uh, Rob is doing at flyingmag.com. And also, thank you for joining us, Rob, on our seventh annual aviation month. This is you're on our seventh annual aviation month with some other amazing aviation guests. So I, I thank you again for coming to Savvy Broadcasting. Thank you. And, and I hope I'm back for eight, for the eighth uh, annual uh, aviation month. And then I can ask you some of those questions and see how your knowledge is progressing. <laughs> Absolutely, Rob. Thank you so much. Thanks for inviting me. If you like this episode, please share. To hear more savvy episodes and savvy biz tips, go to lifeunscriptedradio.com. To become a guest or participate in paid sponsorship, email us at christinalifeunscriptedradio.com.